Krishna, dear devotees, a very warm welcome back again to our ongoing series on the glories of our beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. But first, <laughs> Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Goravani Pacharine, Nivishesha Shunyavari Pastajade Shatarane. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, um, you can see we're in a different uh, environment here than, than usual. I had to leave um, Maharashtra for a few days to come to uh, New Delhi for some practical affairs. And uh, one of our congregation members very kindly provided the studio, his studio, for us to do um, our recording today. So we thank him for that. So you th see things are a little different. <laughs> so, in our last lecture uh, the other day, we spent uh, quite some time explaining the philosophical basis of Radha and Krishna's loving pastimes in Vrindavan. And afterwards, someone wrote to me and said uh, that they would prefer I just shared pastimes and not so much philosophy. But I reminded them that in Krishna book, which is um, Srila Prabhupada's summary of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada shares many of Krishna's pastimes while also weaving in quite a lot of philosophy in order that we can appreciate how Krishna's pastimes are transcendental and are not tinged by anything material. As I mentioned the other day, we also need to hear philosophy so we can defend Krishna, defend Krishna, if and when the general public uh, misunderstands him. I was reading a, a history book the other day that when the, uh, the British ruled India for well, almost several hundred years, they had a policy of suppressing the worship of Krishna and for some time actually promoting the worship of Lord Ramachandra. Because by promoting the worship of Lord Ram, they hoped to get the trust of the people and then introduce them to Christianity. The British, they considered Krishna a liar, a thief, very immoral. He didn't fit into their understanding of religion or God. But Ramachandra for them was an ideal person and a perfect ruler as well. He led a very uh, moral, righteous life. He only had one wife, not like Krishna, 16,108. Of course, little did they know that um, Krishna and Lord Ramachandra are the same person, but anyway. So f for some time, the British promoted the worship of Lord Ram, and they actually tried to discourage people from worshiping Krishna. But we know from a careful study of Srimad Bhagavatam that Krishna is a transcendental personality, the supreme personality of Godhead, far beyond this material nature, far beyond the modes of material nature. And his so-called lying or stealing are simply pastimes that cause no distress to anyone. And for his devotees, they give great spiritual joy and transcendental bliss. And everything about Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes are transcendental, even if he or his devotees may appear, may appear to display material qualities, like jealousy, for example. In the sacred scripture, Ananta Samhita, Lord Shiva tells Parvati that one time um, Krishna was enjoying in a very special kunja, or like a garden in a forest, with a gopi named Viraja, Viraja Gopi. And when one of Shimati Radharani's sakis heard about this, she ran to tell Shimati Radharani. And the Ananta Samhita describes that when moon-faced, doe-eyed Shirada heard that news from her sakhi, she became jealous and came running to the kunj. Now before she arrived, Krishna 
heard her, her coming, so he quickly disappeared. And the Gopi Viraja, she became a river, a river, which encircled the entire circumference of Vrindavan. So when um, Radharani finally arrived at the Kunj um, with some of her friends, Krishna and Viraja were gone. So absorbed in, in thoughts of Krishna, Srimati Radharani began to consider how she could attract her, her beloved away from Gopi Viraja. Now the Acharyas comment that um, uh, her jealousy was not like material jealousy. Material jealousy is all based around ourselves, I, me, and mine. But Shirada's jealousy was about Krishna. And how so? Because she knew, being the principal gopi, that she was capable of pleasing Krishna more than anyone else. And therefore, in Krishna's interest, she hurried to the kunja. This is how it's explained. Not for herself, but to make sure Krishna had the highest pleasure in her association. So as a means or a way to attract Krishna from where he was hiding, from where he disappeared, she um, created from her own transcendental potency a very beautiful place between the Ganges and Jamuna rivers. Then she uh, decorated that place with beautiful creepers and trees and filled it with you know, butterflies and bumblebees and all types of beautiful animals like rabbits and deers, etc. And she also um, manifested uh, in that beautiful abode fragrant jasmine, malika, and malati flowers. Then she called for Cupid along with springtime personified. I liked that part. She called for Cupid along with springtime personified. Then she said to all those entities, for the pleasure of my beloved Krishna, I want you all to reside here eternally. Then she called for all beautiful birds ever created, and she told them, please reside here and sing forever the names of my beloved Krishna. And then what did she do? <laughs> then she took a flute, a flute, and played the most beautiful melody to attract Krishna. And it worked. Within moments, Krishna appeared. And he took her hand and he said, quote, O oh, uh, lovely-faced Radha, you are my very life. There is no one more dear to me than you. Just for me, you have created this wonderful abode, this wonderful dom. From now on, the devotees will always, always glorify this wonderful place that you have made. Let us give it a name, Krishna said. Let us give it a name. So this beautiful abode that she'd manifested, Krishna looked around for a while, looking at it. And um, then he paused for a moment, and he said, quote, famously, because it is an island between two rivers, the wise will call it Navadweep. Hare Krishna. <laughs> the wise will call it Navadweep. And then Krishna went on to say, by my order, all the holy places will come and reside here. Those persons who come to worship us as the divine couple here will certainly attain the mood of the Sakis. And if anyone comes to this holy dom just once, he will receive the benefit of going to all holy places. Hare Krishna. And that place, that abode, dear Prabhus, that is the most sacred Shri Navadweep Mayapur Dham, where our International Society for Krishna Consciousness is presently building our temple of the Vedic planetarium on the desire of our beloved Sridhar Prabhupada. Yes, all by the mercy of Vrindavaneshwari Shri Mati Radharani. <clears throat> 
So we just ended up in Mayapur. <laughs> by Srimati Radharani's grace, but um, we're going to return to Yavat now because this is essentially this lecture is meant to be about <coughs> our little <coughs> mini-series <coughs> about Sri Vrindavan Dham and Yavat in particular. <coughs> so <coughs> we'll tell some more pastimes um, from Yavat. It, there's just so many pastimes from Yavat. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so one time, uh, Kutila, Abhimanyu's sister, you remember, was walking um, uh, through a forest just next to Yava when she saw uh, Radha and Krishna sitting together in a small kunja, a small grove, laughing and joking together. So she immediately turned around and ran as fast as she could back to the Yavat palace and finding Abhimanyu, Radharani's so-called husband, she said, you stupid fool, Abhimanyu, you never believe me when I tell you about the antics of your wife and this rascal Krishna. But just go to the forest now and see for yourself. Go and see what is going on with your own two eyes. Radha and Krishna are sitting together in a kunj in the forest, happily enjoying each other's association. The words of Kutila. So Abhimanyu knows his sister to be somewhat eccentric. And as her name states, she's, she's crooked. But he decided to go to the forest anyway and see for himself if what she was saying was true. <clears throat> So off he went, and uh, when he was approaching the kunja that his sister had indicated, Radharani uh, caught a glimpse of him coming. So she said to Krishna, Krishna, Abhimanyu is coming. What should we do now? So Krishna said, just bow down. So she, Radha, she said, but my husband's coming. So Krishna repeated, just bow down. So Sri Radha bowed down. And the next moment, Abhimanyu arrived there. And what did he see? He saw a beautiful statue of Kali standing there with her chopper and her tongue sticking out. And Radharani, very chastely and for the welfare of her husband, as described, was worshipping the goddess Kali. So Abhimanyu, he said to himself, my sister is so stupid, and she thinks that I'm also stupid. Just see how my wife is nicely worshipping Mother Kali. She's bowing down before a beautiful deity, Mother Kali. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so we've heard about, isn't it, Kali Krishna? We all know about Kali Krishna. So here was Kali Krishna. <laughs> Kali Krishna. So Yavat, it's the most wonderful place. On another occasion, Radha and Krishna were enjoying the uh, pleasing atmosphere of the Vrindavan forest in the company of um, the gopis, other gopis, when uh, Chandravali's close friend, Padma, happened to walk by and see that. And when she saw that, she stopped and she's looking and, you know, the acharyas say she, she was up to no good when she saw Radha and Krishna together. In the sense that in Vrindavan, Chandravali Gopi is Sri Radha's chief competitor. Both of them are always vying for Krishna's attention. And each one of them has helpers in this regard. So Padma is Chandravali's main helper. Of course, one might ask, why does Radharani have a competitor? And we touched on this last year, but it would be nice to cover some of the main points again. All that happens in Vrindavan is meant to increase everyone's love. Krishna's love for Radha, Radha's love for Krishna, the devotee's love for the divine couple, the divine couple's love for the devotees. It's all about love. 
transcendental love, pure love. I heard my godbrother Gurya Swami say in uh, a lecture I was listening to recently, he said that, quote, Krishna consciousness is a movement of love masquerading as a philosophy. Krishna consciousness is a movement of love masquerading as a philosophy. So love reigns supreme in the spiritual world. So just as, we, just as how we spoke recently, how obstacles serve to intensify Radha and Krishna's love for each other, so also this spirit of competition in Vrindavan also increases everyone's attachment to Radha and Krishna. <clears throat> in the material world, when there's uh, competition, someone wins and someone loses. But when there's competition in Krishna consciousness, everyone's a winner. Because the winner or the loser, because of that competition all centered around Krishna, whether you're the winner or the loser in that particular engagement, you just fall more in love with Krishna as a result because Krishna is the center of the competition. So competition can be good. I remember in the 1970s when the Los Angeles Temple beat the Radha Damodar Traveling Book Distribution Party in the number of books distributed. Srila Prabhupada wrote to the uh, temple president in Los Angeles, quote, this is good competition. So now Tamal Krishna is defeated by you. So one month you defeat him and another he can defeat you. And in this way, Radha Damodar's service will be increased by transcendental competition. This is very nice, Prabhupada wrote. This is very nice. In the spiritual world, competition exists solely for the pleasure of Krishna. When Krishna runs ahead of his friends while they play in the fields or the forest of Vrindavan, he's pleased when the boys compete to be the first to touch him. And in Domadar Leela, Krishna competes with his own mother, isn't it? And Yashoda wins. Her pure love conquers Krishna, who submits to being tied to the grinding mortar. Krishna and the gopis compete in attracting one another. Um, Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami writes in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi 4, 192-193, quote, <clears throat> The beauty of Lord Krishna increases at the sight of the beauty of the gopis. And the more the gopis see Krishna's beauty, the more their beauty increases. In this way, a competition takes place between them in which no one acknowledges defeat. And even Krishna uh, speaks of a competition between himself and Srimati Radharani that I found in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila 4.142. There is constant competition between my sweetness and the mirror of Radha's love, Krishna says. They both go on increasing, but neither knows defeat from the Lord. There is constant competition between my sweetness and the mirror of Radha's love. They both go on increasing, but neither knows defeat. So the basic idea is that this uh, transcendental competition acts as a spice that increases the love of the Vrindavan devotees for Krishna and Krishna's love for his devotees. And once again, there's no real losers in Vrindavan. Everyone's a winner. Srila Prabhupada wrote to um, my godbrother, uh, Sri Govinda Das, uh, December 6, 1974, quote, Sometimes we may differ, but Krishna is the center. Just like in Vrindavan, there is Radharani's party and there's Chandravali's party. So Krishna is the center of both parties. So even there is competition between the parties, but they all coincide in Krishna. Transcendental competition. What would we know about transcendental competition if it wasn't for Sri <laughs> So. Chandravali and Radharani 
are the, uh, the chief competitors for uh, Krishna's love. But as I was researching the matter, I came to understand that uh, Chandravali, she almost always loses in that competition between her and Sri Radha for the simple reason that no one's love can compare with Sri Radha's love for Krishna and her ability to uh, attract him. Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 8.98 says, In Hara Madhya Radhara Prema, Sajya Sudomani, In Hara Mahima Sarva, Shastrete Vakani. Quote, Among the loving affairs of the gopis, Ramananda Rai continued, Srimati Radharani's love for Sri Krishna is topmost. Indeed, the glories of Srimati Radharani are highly esteemed in all revealed scriptures. So Radharani is able to attract and control Krishna more than Chandravali. Why? We'll go a little deeper here. Because her mood is called Madhya Mai Bhava. Her mood is called Madhya Mai Bhava, which means in this mood, Radharani is thinking, Krishna is mine. And the Charyas say that with that mood, she can order Krishna to do anything, and he will do it. Madhya Mai Bhav, he'll do whatever, whatever she says. In other words, Srimati Radharani controls Krishna. But Chandravali's mood is a little different. It's called Tadhya Bhava, or sometimes in Shastra it's called Dakshina. It's a submissive mood. In that mood she thinks, I am Krishna's. And submissive to Krishna, she does what Krishna desires. That's the difference between her and Radharani. So the connoisseurs of um, spiritual love, they say that Radharani's love is madhu sneha. It's more attractive to Krishna because it's like honey, madhu, sweet and familiar. Whereas Chandravali's love is gurita sneha, like ghee. Girita, and they're therefore cool and formal. So Radharani's love or mood, according to the connoisseurs of, you know, rasa, <laughs> is more powerful than Chandravali's. And, and in their fierce competition for Krishna's favor, Shirata always wins. Now, actually, as I was studying more about this, uh, I've discovered that there are many competitive pastimes in Vrindavan, not only between you know, Radha and Chandravali, but amongst other gopis as well. Even different groups of gopis, they compete for Krishna's favor. And there's different groups. It's, it, one time Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is very scientific. <laughs> there's lots of details here. So different groups and diff gopis with different moods. Actually, there's primarily four groups of, of gopis in Vrindavan. Number one, Svapaksha, those belonging to, to Radharani's own group. There's Vipaksha, those gopis belonging to the group of Radharani's ri rivals. There's Tataksha Paksha, those gopis belonging to the group that is neutral towards Shirada and Surit Paksha, um, those belonging to the group that is friendly to her. It all breaks down like that. So they all love Krishna, and they all desire Krishna's attention. So there's rivalry and competition between them. However, and this is, to use a phrase, Iskand phrase, this next part is simply wonderful. The Acharyas describe so sweetly that whenever Krishna disappears, like he does from the rasa dance, or even more so, when Krishna goes away to Mathura or to Dwarka, during those times, all the individual gopis in all the different groups and subgroups of gopis become one for Krishna. They become one for Krishna, as one Acharya puts it. And they give up their transcendental animosity. 
and they all console each other in their feelings of separation. Krishna's gone. The Acharyas write that even uh, Chandravali and Bhadra, who have very uh, contrary moods towards Radharani, they come and pacify Srimati Radharani. And why so? Because her feelings of separation are the deepest and most painful. How do we understand that? Because she's most attached to Krishna. Therefore, her feelings of separation are very, very intense. She has the Mahabhav, the purest love. So these gopis, they're usually contrary, in competition sense, to Shirada. But when Krishna leaves, they're very sympathetic towards her because their separation mood is not as intense as hers. They say to her, quote, O Radhika, you should not weep. Krishna will come back. And actually, Shirada herself speaks the same way to Chandavali. This we find in Rupa Goswami's Lalita Madhava, 339, that after Krishna left for Mathura, Radha and her friends searched for him everywhere in Vrindavan, convinced that he was hiding somewhere. So Rupa Goswami describes that at Govardhan Hill, while they were searching at Govardhan Hill, Sri Radha caught sight of her own reflection in a pond, but she thought it was Chandravali. <laughs> because Radharani and Chandravali, they look very similar. Actually, in reality, they're, they are cousins because their fathers are brothers. And you could say they're like identical twins. <clears throat> the only difference is that Shirada's eyes are dark blue and Chandravali's eyes are light blue. Just like Krishna and Balaram. Th together, they're the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Of course, Balaram is the first expansion of Krishna. But Prabhupada said on several occasions, the only difference between Krishna and Balaram is that Krishna's uh, bluish-black like a monsoon cloud and Balaram's like a white autumn cloud. So now you get a better understanding of Chandravali. She's Radharani's cousin. And the only difference is that Chandravali's eyes are light blue and Radha's eyes are dark blue. So when Sri Radharani and her gopis were looking for Krishna, he left. Then she came to a pond at, at, at um, Govardhan Hill. She looked in and she, she thought, oh, th there's Chandravali. <laughs> So it's nicely described by Rupa Goswami that um, Radha uh, appealed to Chandravali with the following words, Sandrai Sundari Vrindasho Hariparish Mangir Idam Mangalam. So sweet. O Chandravali, how fortunate I am to see you. Up to now, it has been a most inauspicious day. How many times Krishna held you tightly in his arms? Quickly, water my thirsty soul by wrapping your arms, which still carry the fragrance of Krishna's flower ornaments around my neck. Wow. Lalita Madhava 944. Radharani speaking to her chief competitor. The reflection in the pond. O oh, Chandravali, how fortunate I am to see you. Up to now, it has been a most inauspicious day. How many times Krishna held you tightly in his arms? Quickly, water my thirsty soul by wrapping your arms, which still carry the fragrance of Krishna's flower ornaments around my neck. Hare Krishna. This is on a very high level, of course, but it so much reminds me of Srila Prabhupada's advice to us. Isn't it? He said... Your love for me will be tested how you cooperate together when I am gone. That's, that's what came to my mind. <laughs> my spiritual master. <laughs> that's the sagest. <laughs> so in other words, Prabhupada was and is and forevermore will be training us to be true Brajabhasis. So again, uh, Radha and Krishna were enjoying that pleasing atmosphere in that Vrindavan forest in the company of their girlfriends when 
Chandravali's, we had to talk about Chandravali. Chandravali's close friend, Padma, happened to walk by. So Padma, loyal to Chandravali, thought to get Radharani in trouble. So she quickly went to Yavat. She quickly went to Yavat to tell Jatila what she had seen. And hearing this news from Padma, Jatila immediately made her way to find Radha and Krishna together. And when she arrived at where they were, the divine couple were caught off guard. This time there, was, <laughs> there wasn't a chance to disappear like in the previous pastime. Jatila came, she caught them red-handed, to use a common term. So caught off guard by Jatila, described Radha and Krishna froze in fear. And they just stared speechlessly at Jatila, who herself was horror-struck, standing a short distance away. Of course, Yoga Maya has arranged all these pastimes, so for Namasi. So then just at that moment, Sri Radha's friend, Shamashaki, happened to pass by. So taking advantage of having another person there, half-blind, half-blind Jatila decided to ask Shamashaki to be her witness in reporting, to, um, reporting Krishna to, to King Kamsa and locking Srimati Radharani up forever. Jatila was determined. I'll, I'll use Shamasaki as, as a witness and we'll go to King Kamsa and we'll report what this rascal Krishna is doing. But um, Shamasaki uh, was very clever. And taking in the scene, she actually came to Radharani's rescue by making up a story. For when Jatila asked her, Shama, I have faith in you. Tell me exactly what you see. It's very clear, isn't it? Radha and Krishna are here together. But Shamasaki, she replied very innocently, Mother Jatila, I see that Krishna is up to his tricks as usual. He has dressed Subala as a girl. And the two jokers are pretending that they are yakshas and yakshis who regularly come here to bathe and enjoy this forest. So knowing her eyesight to be bad, Jatila replied, Oh, yes, yes, that's what I thought, Subal and Krishna. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that's what I thought, Subal and Krishna. And the, the acharyas described, And with that, the angry old woman hobbled home. Yes, yes, that's what I thought, Subal and Krishna. Hare Krishna. Shiva Navanamaki. <laughs> so much nectar. So let us conclude today, because I've come to Delhi to do a few things, so please excuse me. Um, let us finish today with um, a few passages just straight from the Bhagavatam, straight from Srimad Bhagavatam. Some very beautiful passages about our most beloved Sri Vrindavan the very goal of our lives. And the more we hear about it, the more we hanker for Sri Vrindavan Dham. Actually, my good fortune, having left Maharashtra for maybe a week or even two, for some things in Delhi, when I finished at the Delhi Affairs, I'm going to Braj. Wow. And after studying so much about Vrindavan and trying my best to, to share with all of you Vrindavan, um, I'm really hankering to go there. I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. <laughs> Maybe I won't leave. <laughs> well, I have to go back to Maharashtra, but um, while I'm there, you know, I, I bought my camera. I haven't used my camera in Vrindavan for like almost two years now. Looking forward, I'll, I'll put some um, nice photo albums up on uh, Facebook for everybody. Anyway. Let's hear from uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, the glories of Vrindavan. Very fitting way to finish today. Goloka, also called Vrindavan, is always full of cows. There are many waterfalls which are always pouring water, and the sound is so sweet that it covers the sound of the crickets. And because water flows all over, the forest always looks very green and very beautiful. 
The inhabitants of Vrindavan are never disturbed by the scorching heat of the sun or high summer temperatures. The lakes of Vrindavan are surrounded by green grasses and various kinds of lotus flowers bloom there. The air blowing in Vrindavan carries the aromatic pollen of those lotus flowers. With the particles of water from the waves of the Jumun River, the lakes and the waterfalls touch the bodies of the inhabitants of Vrindavan, they automatically feel a cooling effect. Vrindavan is such a nice place. Vrindavan is such a nice place. Flowers are always blooming, and there are even various kinds of decorated deer. Birds are chirping, peacocks are crowing and dancing, and bees are humming. The cuckoos there sing nicely in five kinds of tunes. Krishna, the reservoir of pleasure, blowing his flute, accompanied by his elder brother Balaram and the other coward boys and cows, enters the beautiful forest of Vrindavan to enjoy the atmosphere. They walk into the midst of newly grown leaves of trees whose flowers resemble peacock feathers. They are garlanded, garlanded by those flowers and decorated with saffron chalk. Sometimes they are dancing and singing and sometimes wrestling with one another. While Krishna dances, some of the cowherd boys sing and others play on flutes. Some bugle on buffalo horns or clap their hands, praising Krishna, dear brother, you are dancing very nicely. We could go on for eternity, actually, but um, we'll stop there. Thank you, Prabhu, again for this um, privileged opportunity. And um, amidst my practical affairs here, I'll, I'll read some more, and I'll, I'll be back in a couple of days with more pastimes from Yava. Actually, we've just begun to touch on Yavad and what to speak of so many other places in Vrindavan. So we'll be doing this for a while. So thank you. See you soon. Shishi Gornitai ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sindhu ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani ki, Krishna Balaram ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Shri Goku Vrindavan ki, Shri Goloka Vrindavan dham. Or pregnant J J C C Rod Hey Shime 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 Shiva Navadamaki All glorious Shiva Bhagavan Hari Bhagavan